Hey guys, welcome to our 2020 virtual wheat plot tours. So this is a little different than what we typically are. Usually we're standing out in the field and are having a chance to visit with all of our friends and neighbors and talk about how their wheat looks. Well, this is a little different this year since we can't get together out in the field. And so we have a whole series of K-State wheat specialists with us, which we would typically see at wheat plot tours or you've probably seen many times. And um, they're gonna kind of just talk through varieties. What I have here is it's just kind of an overview of what we've been going through, what we've our wheat's been put through this year, and then we're going to talk about the wheat varieties. I have pictures from all four of our wheat plots on here, and so you'll be able to see what on here what you would be seeing when you're in the field. So um, we have several wheat specialists with us. We have Romolo Lolato. Romolo is our K-State Extension Wheat Specialist. We have Lucas Haig, who is our Northwest Area Agronomist. Eric Dwolf, who is our uh, wheat pathologist, and Kelsey Anderson, who is also a K-State wheat pathologist. Kelsey's our, our new extension wheat pathologist coming in and, and is really just kind of, uh, we kind of threw her in the field here just in the last couple of weeks to, uh, here in Kansas to start looking at wheat. So with that, we'll go ahead and just take off. We're going to quickly go through um, just kind of what we're seeing out in the field and where to find your wheat plots in your county. So here is where all of our wheat plots are located. They're very close to where they have been in many years. In Cheyenne County, you just go down Highway 27 south of Wheeler and you'll see it on the left-hand side. Um, in Sherman County, it's right there at Fred and Jeannie Shields on the north side of the trees. Um, if you're down in Wallace County, you have two opportunities to work, look at wheat plots, and that includes over at my farms. They're just right east of Bill and Wilma's house. And if you are um, going over to the E and H plots with Eric Purvis, if you turn south on Road Three and drive until you see the tree, and if you're familiar with that area, you'll know what that means. So go to the tree and then another two thirds of a mile south and you'll see the wheat plot there on the west side. So they're easy to find. If you have any questions, just give me a holler and I can get you pointed right in that direction. Okay, so just a little bit of information on the wheat plots. I want you guys to have all the information of the care that's been done to those. So our cooperators in Cheyenne County, Sunny Crest Farms, um, these were planted on September 19th. Well, a majority of them were planted on September 19th and then the tractor broke down on me. So our last four plots were drilled just a little bit later of them. Um, they were drilled 60 pounds per acre in two inches, um, two inch depth with into, into some pretty good moisture. Um, this field is trying to get back in the wheat rotation and so this was wheat actually drilled back into wheat stubble and that will be important when we talk a little bit further here about the care of it. Um, the fertility was 85 pounds of nitrogen and 30 of FOSS. It had um, a herbicide application, Grace Flying Service took care of spraying for us and um, a herbicide application of Ally 2,4-D and dicamba. And then here a couple of weeks ago when I was out walking through the plots, I was noticing that we were seeing some tan spot. Well, tan spot is really a disease when we start seeing wheat after wheat and it overwinters on wheat stubble. And so tan spot was showing up. So we went ahead and put on a fungicide application of tribuconazole to kind of help suppress that tan spot in the lower canopy. In Sherman County, we're at Fred and Jeannie Shields. Those were drilled on October 1st. The seeding rate is 75 pounds per acre. It had starter fertilizer, and then it had fertilizer over the top, and then another top dress set of fertilizer. So quite a bit of nutrients, a pretty strong uh, nutrient package on that. It also had um, herbicide put on, so finesse and MCPA, and then had a top dress um, application of fungicide also. Um, it did not have a later application of fungicide because we didn't start seeing stripe rust here until the last couple of weeks and so no fungicide over the top. Okay, at ENH Farm south of Weskin, um, this was drilled on September 30th. We had 50 pounds per acre into some pretty decent moisture. Not great, but not awful. Um, the field rotation is a wheat corn fallow rotation. At drilling, we um, they had actually drilled through the plot perpendicular to where we were going to put the plot in with 60 pounds of 40 rock. In January, it had a top dress application and again in March. And the herbicide that they put down was Culex and Dicamba. 
Over at my farms, they were drilled on September 28th. Um, it was put in at 50 pounds per acre into some really good moisture. Um, this is a limited tillage program on these plots and so it had been uh, tilled prior to us drilling. And we had 60 pounds of nitrogen that went on with those. Their fertility program is really where we put a lot of their FOSS down with the corn part of the rotation and then put um, some nitrogen on ahead of, ahead of weed drilling. It also has not had a fungicide application out on it, although we can start to see some stripe rust here in just this last week. Okay, if you stop and look at uh, the wheat plots, here um, you will see a mailbox at each one of the wheat plots, and that is where your plot plans are. So you can go in, open the mailbox, there's a plot plan right there, here. Um, they're pretty quick here. There will also be a variety booklet in there that you can pick up and then walk through the plots and look to see how they're looking. We also have them posted on our website at sunflower.ksu.edu slash agronomy. Okay, so let's just do a quick overview of everything that Mother Nature has kind of thrown at our wheat, at our wheat this year. So we had some real um, kind of, uh, I don't want to say dicey drilling conditions, but it seemed like um, moisture was really the driving factor on what kind of stands we got this last fall. Part of that was influenced by tillage, part of it was last year's weed pressure, just some um, Good moisture made wheat come up pretty quickly and got it started. And um, if we were lacking on moisture, some of that wheat sat there and waited for quite a while before it actually came up and got going. Um, we didn't have a lot of fall growth on a lot of our wheat in the area. And here's just a quick look at what the National Weather Service in Goodland had for our precipitation. You can see um, over September and October, we were over an inch and a half below normal. Okay, April was a little rough on our wheat, and I think many of you guys and I spent quite a bit of time talking on the phone about what was going on. And so here we had a couple of shots of cold air that came through. So um, on April 3rd, we dropped down to 16.6. At this point, the growing points of our wheat was below surface, quite a ways below the surface still. And so we burnt some top growth on this, but we didn't actually do much damage to our wheat. Fast forward when we go over a couple of weeks later, um, Sunday after uh, Easter here, then it got pretty cold. And so here I'm showing Sherman County, we were got down to 13.7 um, that started really on uh, April 12th and then extended out to the 15th. So cold temperatures at that point, what we were seeing then is that a lot of growing points were right at or right below the soil, or excuse me, right at or right below, above the soil surface, which made everybody a little concerned to see what we would be finding out there in the field. Um, let me back up just a little bit on that. What we really saw from that cold snap was that we had uh, a lot of top growth that was kind of burnt back. And we sloughed off some tillers and we had a whole lot of uh, dry, well, it wasn't dry at the time, but um, necrotic leaf tissue down at the base of those plants where we just burnt back a lot of leaf tissue on that. Okay, pest concerns. We had some weeds that were around, not a ton of weeds because we didn't have a lot of moisture to really get weeds started last fall. Um, mustard, some downy brome and cheat. Um, my concern going forward is that with some of this wheat now that has a thinner stand as a result of those April temperatures that we might be seeing some weeds coming in prior to harvest. And so keep that in mind. There are some options, not great options, but some options for burning some of those weeds back if we need to for wheat harvest time. Um, I mentioned diseases a little bit earlier. Um, wheat streak mosaic hasn't been a super hot topic this year, but we have seen just a little bit of it around uh, tan spot. I know mentioned that in our Cheyenne County wheat plot. And then here in the last week or week and a half, we started seeing stripe rust show up. Um, insects, we did have some brown wheat mite pressure showing up, um, likely because of our drought conditions. I had some calls of folks out looking at wheat. We're seeing a ton of aphids this year. Well, we did have quite a few aphids, but there was a lot of ladybugs out there and ladybug larvae that were just really chowing down and helping suppress our aphid population on those. So we're going to I'm going to just jump right into discussing wheat varieties here. So I'll hand this over to Lucas and Romolo to kind of talk about these varieties. And then Eric and Kelsey will step in and visit just a little bit about the diseases that 
should be of concern or have really good resistance on these. So we'll switch gears into varieties now. Okay, very well. Uh, thanks, Jeannie, for that great introduction there. Um, I guess the first variety that we have out here, uh, Avery, and Jeannie, you had mentioned that you grouped these varieties by, by, by characteristic, right? So I guess the, the group that we have coming up first, they would all be related to bird, correct? That is correct, yes. And being related to bird, we have the TAM112 on the background that brings a few things that these varieties might have in common. That includes pretty decent tolerance to dry conditions, so a very good drought tolerance there. Uh, usually, right, also with termite, uh, so they're, they're non preferred by the with termite, which can help with which rip mosaic virus there. Um, and they might also have some issues with standability, right? So TAM112 did not have the best trust strength out there, and, and it brings forward in some of these progenies of that TAM112 variety. So uh, Avery actually is a cross of bird with TAM112, right? And it brings some of those uh, characteristics to the table. They are good drought with chromite, some green bug resistance here on Avery as well. But again, just that average straw strength. Bird has a very small kernel size. Avery might be an improvement on that, uh, but it's still uh, very related to, to that bird background. Yield-wise, in Northwest Kansas, if we look three years in a row, uh, Avery has been like a bush or so more than what we had in bird. Yeah, so and, on the uh, busy side, one of the other things that comes out of the uh, TAM 112 is the Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think, yes. I think so. Okay. You might have cut out there for a moment, or maybe my internet did, but you might yeah, have to no, read my... I got a little note there that my internet was unstable, so... Yeah, let me uh, say, uh, you know, and the TAM-112 connection there, that uh, does bring some uh, weak chromite resistance, which Homlo has pointed out is, is helpful for uh, control of wheat streak mosaic, where the wheat chromite populations seem to develop more slowly. And uh, the, I think some of these varieties have, have looked good, or at least better, than uh, many other wheat varieties. And, and we kind of end up giving them a uh, intermediate reaction to, to wheat streak mosaic. The other thing that's important uh, for you will notice out of a lot of these varieties is that TAM-112 background also did not bring, have a lot of uh, stripe rust, leaf rust type of resistance as well. And that spring, uh, brings forward into a lot of these uh, progeny in uh, Bird and Avery uh, are noted for their high degree of susceptibility to stripe rust and leaf rust. So there's a lot of other desirable characteristics here. Uh, just be ready to use the fungicide uh, for these more susceptible varieties. I would tell you guys as I was looking for stripe rust, um, Avery and Bird are some of the varieties that I would go into first because I knew they were highly susceptible when I was looking for stripe rust. And then Romolo, tell us just, you started in on a little bit of yield information. Do you want to talk just a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, maybe uh... Jeannie, as you move to the bird there, we can discuss the, the, the yield record in both of them here. But uh, so really, if we look just for Northwest Kansas at K-State trials there in the last three years, uh, Avery has been a bushel per acre or so out yielding bird in the average of the last three years. We, if we look just last year, though, birds seem to have a better performance than Avery. So I think it's really depending on environmental conditions. One might out yield the other one by a bushel or so. Uh, I think also Lucas generally makes the comment that in the Colorado side, Avery seems to have a more consistent uh, yield than, than, or yield advantage over bird than the other way around. But really, uh, they, they are genetically similar. Um, uh, yield performance, again, look at the last three years, I think Avery has been about a bush or so per acre than bird. But just looking last year, bird out yielded Avery. So again, very drought tolerance varieties. I think it's, it's varieties that have proven themselves in the region as long as we're willing to spray a polar fungicide out there. So I have bird pulled up here. This is in the Sherman County plot. And then we also have bird CL plus. Lucas, do you want to tell us just a little bit about the CL part of this? Yeah, so, and, and we'll get into the, the coaxium. We turn a little bit, but you know, we got two uh, different options available to us for some in-season uh, grass control. Uh, it used to be, you know, in, in this part of the world, we relied, uh, uh, pretty heavily on brawl, 
uh, CL Plus to, to carry the load for us on Clearfield. But now uh, with Bird, I, this would probably become uh, my top pick for a Clearfield wheat uh, in, in, uh, in the Sunflower District. So we know, we know the Bird platform. Uh, we just, uh, they went in and stuck that 2G and Clearfield on it. So we can use a little higher use rate, use some MSO in the tank to, uh, to heat up the mix. And so, yeah, for a Clearfield wheat uh, for our part of the world, I, I think Bird CL Plus is the obvious pick. So Western Star, a fairly new release out of the Hayes program. And, and again, I think this is one we need to keep a, an eye on. I think it's going to find a home on a fair number of acres in, in uh, Western Kansas. Um, so it, it brings to the table uh, uh, some resistance on uh, Wheat Streak Mosaic. And so I think we'll see that, you know, traditionally we relied on Oakley for that, but uh, here we got some medium maturity, medium height, um, pretty decent straw strength on it. Um, its yield record in the preliminary yield trials has, has been quite strong. So uh, I think Western Star, and we'll visit about Dallas as well, um, is, is being uh, some new releases from K-State that uh, I think are a good fit here. I think from the disease side, we're excited about Western Star. We need to see it a little bit more, but it does carry that resistance to the weed curl mite. So you might have some... Um, a little less wheat streak mosaic to worry about. And then it's holding up fairly well against um, leaf rust and stripe rust. And so we've, we've seen it here just recently in some of the USDA screening nurseries where they'll, um, they'll hit it pretty hard with these rust um, pathogens. And, and, and this one's been holding up well. So I think it, it's probably a good option for this part of, part of Kansas. So the next two in the lineup, Canvas and Whistler, and so again, more bird derivatives here, but some key differences between these two. Uh, and so uh, I guess I'll, I'll talk about Whistler here for a minute because it kind of leads me back to Canvas. And so uh, Whistler had looked, uh, had looked really good in some yield trials. The part of it that really concerns me though is, is rated very weak on straw strength. And, uh, and so that's, that's something that gives me a little bit of heartburn. So we get some nice height out of it. It's yielded fairly well, but it's, it's straw strength scores really towards the poorer end of about any variety that, that we're uh, considering. So, so that kind of takes me back to Canvas. There's a trade-off here. Canvas is a shorter, a little shorter wheat. We don't get near the height out of what we might like for some of our no-till systems, um, but it does have much improved uh, straw strength and a yield record on it that's looked uh, very strong as well. So, uh, but again, kind of uh, in, in, this, in this medium maturity range, again, that bird background, all we'd expect them all to have fairly high levels of, of drought tolerance as well. So uh, in Langen, oops, sorry, Jeannie, was you saying? No, that was okay. Go right ahead. Um, you know, we're all pretty familiar with Langen. This is one uh, you've heard Jeannie and I talk about a lot over the years. We had the chance to see it very early on as an experimental, and it, and it caught our eye. Um, it's, it's got some shortcomings that, that Kelsey can hit on here in a minute. Um, you know, one of the things that was really different about it um, coming out of the CSU program was really kind of one of their first earlier maturing weeds that we had seen in quite a while with the exception of Brawl. Uh, but Langen's yield record is, has been terrific as long as its weaknesses have been managed. Uh, straw strength is, is pretty decent. It's a little bit shorter than I might like a week to be here, but we still see pretty good residue at tillers well. Uh, so, you know, even after stripper harvest, it leaves some really nice residue. And so it's, it's found a real nice fit here. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. So Langen's a good candidate for for heavily scouting to see if you might need a fungicide application. It does bring it with, with it some below average resistance to leaf rust, um, also to stem rust. So we don't have a lot of varieties that have, um, that are susceptible to stem rust in the pipeline. So this is one where if this is grown on, on, um, on wide acreage, we might start to see that pop up up as a problem. It's also susceptible to tan spot. So Jeannie talked about tan spot in the, in the beginning. So this is one to watch to scout. Um, and if the disease pressure is starting to get high, uh, a, a, fo a foliar fungicide might really help. It does have decent stripe rust resistance, so that might not be as big of a concern here. Um, but Langan is susceptible to wheat streak mosaics. So again, with all of its pluses, there's, there's a few um, disease shortcomings that might need to be managed. 
Yeah, and that's an excellent point, Kelsey. And so you look at both, uh, well, even though Whistler's got the weak straw, but you look at Canvas having some wheat streak mosaic resistance. I think there's a, a strong argument there that maybe we'll see some of them Langan areas, acres move over. And then I can't remember, how's Canvas on stem rust? Do we get stem rust resistance with it? Canvas, I believe, has um, it does. stem rust. Yes, it does. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I was, I was going to comment, you know, it, it seems like Langan, Bird, Avery, a lot of these uh, uh, recent releases, uh, fairly recent releases, that generation was quite vulnerable out of the Colorado program. But I, I think you're right. I think uh, Canvas is, is maybe the exception to that, where they've uh, uh, turned, turned the corner with maybe some of that vulnerability now. But uh, Kelsey's right on. I, I think this kind of susceptibility is really out on a lot of acres in, in uh, northwest Kansas right now. I would just add on that. I remember as I was walking through the plots, it always just seems like a kind of a, a smaller compact wheat with lots and lots of heads. And um, at the beginning of a couple of our plots, we had just is getting your drill started um, where it's a little bit thinner in seeding rate and it just really had lots of tillers out there. So it really, it catches my attention every time we walk through, although it does have some vulnerabilities that we need to be very cognizant of. So we're going to switch into talk about coaxium wheat. So we touched on Clearfield just a little bit ago with um, Bird CL Plus, and so we're going to move into coaxium wheats. So Jeannie, you want to take a minute and just uh, describe real quickly aggressor herbicide, what that's uh, effective on, and, and mode of action? So we would be looking at this coaxium uh, system, which is somewhat similar to the Clearfield system. And so we talk about Clearfield Beyond is the herbicide that we spray on coaxium, which has the designation of AX. We would be using the aggressor herbicide. And it also goes in and we're taking out um, some grassy problems that we'd have showing up in those fields. And so um, rye would be a very good uh, reason to be put planting coaxium wheat. Um, it's pretty decent on jointed goat grass. Um, Rye and some of the other ones along those lines are really what we're going to be probably going in with coaxium, um, the coaxium technology to take care of. And just um, looking around at wheat fields this year, it seems like there are certain areas where I seem to be seeing a lot of this rye, rye showing up. And so if this is a, a perennial problem that you're having in one of your fields or some other grassy problems, then stop and think about using this coaxium system. So we'll talk about these varieties kind of as a group. Uh, they all have uh, very similar genetics. They got about a third hatcher and uh, two thirds bird in them. As you remember, hatcher was a, did very well in, in uh, Northwest Kansas in the mid 2000s as wheat. And then of course we're, we're familiar with bird. Um, it's very similar pedigrees. And, and frankly, we don't have enough yield data on these to really sort them out. So in, in Jeannie and her plot, she has Crescent, uh, AX, Fusion AX, or LCS Fusion AX and then Incline, um, all very similar pedigree. The only thing, uh, you know, looking at the, some of the information that has come out of uh, Scott Haley, the breeder over at Colorado State, um, is that Incline probably has a little better rating on straw strength than the other two. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, I, it'd be really good to get another year's worth of yield data here and, and kind of get a better feel for where at in, in the region these, these varieties are, are better adapted. Than, than each other. So I guess it's kind of a, a stay tuned and if you're needing this uh, tool hopefully here by the time we're making variety decisions in August we'll have uh, a little better feel for what belongs where. As we go back to the clear field technology here right with that CL uh, behind the name of the variety Oakley CL is already have several years on it uh, here in, in, in the plane so growers actually know Oakley uh, quite well. It's important to remember that it is a single gene clear field. So uh, Lucas mentioned that uh, some of those two gene clear fields can get the high rate of beyond with some MSO in the mix. That would not be the case for Oakley CL, right? This being really a single gene clear field that uh, you, you'd have to follow the labor restrictions quite clearly there without going with that highest rate or MSO in the mix. So Oakley, uh, it has had a, a decent yield record. Uh, I think one of the one of the calling cards for Oakley was the WSM2 gene for wheat streak mosaic resistance that uh, probably Eric can talk to us a little bit here in, in a second. Uh, but again, I think right now we, we're having either uh, Kansas Dallas or Western Star as new releases 
that might take pictures where Oakley still is still there, right? Remembering that Oakley is a certified seed only that you need to buy a seed every year. Uh, maturity wise on that medium, medium, late maturity side. I've seen it lodged in a few instances there. So it's trust strength is about average. Uh, so again, it has had its place, especially uh, on for a wheat streak mosaic. But uh, I think we have newer options now that might be on the growers list. But uh, Eric, what, what's that WSM2 gene that we talk about? Yeah, that WSM2 gene is a, a gene that was brought over some from some wild relatives of wheat that uh, does confer true resistance to the wheat streak mosaic. But remember, there was always some caveats here is that we often refer to wheat streak mosaic or just mosaic and, and, to, and really reference to a whole complex of, of viral diseases that are spread by wheat curl mites. And uh, this WSM2 gene that was uh, the copy that's here in, in Oakley is it was a big step forward. It probably uh, was effective up to around, uh, oh, I guess around 65 to uh, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we had warm temperatures, it would downregulate that resistance. And, and then the issue with the complex of, of viruses is that it didn't have uh, this particular variety was didn't have very good resistance to tritic or mosaic or high plane. So when we have multiple viruses present at the same location, uh, uh, we would sometimes see symptoms in Oakley that were maybe comparable to some other susceptible varieties. And, and that was frustrating to, to uh, growers and, and to us uh, as well. So I would estimate that maybe 60, 70% of the time, varieties like Oakley looked uh, a lot better, but uh, there was also means there was uh, 30 or 40% of the time that, that kind of left us frustrated and, and uh, wringing our hands a little bit, wondering uh, if we would ever make some headway here. And it, it does seem like there's a whole new generation of, of wheat streak mosaic uh, resistant varieties. Some of them have this WSM2, some of them layer that WSM2 with a little better genetic background that has resistance to the triticum mosaic and uh, also that type of TM uh, 112 type of wheat curl mite resistance that we discussed in, in context of Bird and Avery and, and Langan. Uh, so I think uh, by layering these different uh, uh, genes, different uh, genetic strategies of trying to control this virus, I'm pretty excited that we may have some much better varieties, much better tools to uh, to address our problems with wheat streak mosaic, you know, that complex of viral diseases in the in the Northwest very soon. Eric, when we're talking about the newer, the other newer varieties that are coming out, is there a temperature difference in how, what the thresholds are on those? Well, yeah, it, it does sound like it. It's somewhat to be uh, tested of just how practical the, the difference will be, but it does sound uh, like, for, for example, uh, KS Dallas out of that Hayes program, growing Hayes, or growing, uh, thing, the uh, a wheat breeder there at Hayes is this one can go up into the low 70s now, uh, where Oakley would have symptoms when we got into the mid to when we got into the mid to upper 60s. So we've kind of previewed Dallas here just a little bit as we've been talking about Oakley. Um, what else do we need to fill in for information on Dallas? So the yield record on Dallas has been uh, very strong in the Western trials. Um, so, you know, believe uh, as a, uh, you know, a fairly decent level of drought tolerance in it. Uh, and so it's, it's like I said, really, of, uh, you know, decent straw strength on it. Not, uh, uh, you know, not super strong, but certainly an improvement over Tatanka. And I guess that's the other wheat we haven't mentioned yet. I think between Dallas and Western Star, not, not only can they, uh, replace some acres of Oakley, but uh, uh, but re replace some acres of Tatanka as well. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, for all the, for everything to bring the table, I, I think it's uh, something to be excited about. And also, I guess Lucas, the fact that it's not a CSO, right? Because many times that uh, that could hold folks back whenever uh, getting seed from a wheat variety is that commitment you have to buy it again. So yeah, between all of that, we're quite excited with with, uh, with Dallas coming coming to the table there. So. Yeah, that's an excellent excellent point. So because here's uh, you know here's a, an example. Uh, Guardian is a CSO, um, a new release from Colorado State, and also has wheat streak mosaic resistance in it, um, both from WSM2 gene as well as wheat curl mite resistance. So it's Antero by Snowmass by Bird. So 
pull in a little bit better milling and baking quality with that snow mass background, uh, medium height, medium maturity. Uh, you know, we, we don't have a lot of yield data on it, preliminary trials, it, it looks decent. Uh, it, it'd be interesting how, uh, you know, how it gets out on acres, but uh, keeping an eye on it. Anything else we need to visit about with Guardian? Yeah, I was just checking my notes here from the disease side. I think it's, it's new to us, so we have some information um, that's been uh, described about it, but we don't exactly, we haven't seen it on our Kansas State screening nurseries as much. I did see it last week in the, um, in the Stripe Rust nursery down in Hutchinson, and it was holding up pretty well to Stripe and Leaf Rust. I don't know if Eric has anything to add about the disease package of Guardian. I think we're gonna definitely have to look at it over these next couple of years. Yeah, I think so. I think this is one uh, that I'm pretty excited about, uh, mostly from its wheat streak in, in combination with that wheat streak, uh, wheat curl mite resistance. Uh, the bird is still out for me on some of the, where these are guys are going to fall out on some of the resistance to some of the rust. So kind of a mixed bag, some mixed signals happening there where all through their development, it looks like uh, they were showing some pretty good resistance. And then some of them seem like they're falling off a little bit to hear right out of the chute. So uh, and that could be some of the, the changes that we're once again seeing in our stripe rust population in the, the central plains. Okay, so while we've been talking a lot about diseases, we also probably need to be talking about the insect side of things. And so this is um, a new variety out of Colorado State, the Sportify SF, and the SF stands for sawfly. Lucas, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's uh, kind of exciting the fact that this is the first, uh, not necessarily a solid stem, but more of a uh, being considered a semi-solid stem that's uh, adapted to the Central Plains. Uh, and those of you might remember the plots that uh, Jeannie and Alan Schlegel and I had out a couple years ago looking at solid stem varieties. You might remember a variety in there called Bear Paw. And so Fortify is actually 25% Bear Paw, 75% Bird. And so that's how it was basically made, was taking bird and continually back crossing uh, in uh, bear paw in order to try and get that uh, that solid stem trait and so uh, you know yield wise it's uh, you know if, if you don't have saw fly pressure fortify is not uh, not a variety you're probably going to be planting um, but it's been pretty competitive and certainly a, a much more competitive yield wise uh, compared to bringing down bear paw or judy or one of the solid stem varieties so uh, for those growers in Northeast Colorado that are currently fighting this issue, this is a, a huge step forward. And, uh, and hopefully this doesn't become an issue for us, but in the event that it does, uh, this is, is, is really nice to know that we've got a, a regionally adapted variety that we can use if we need to. And we would ask any of the growers, if you see any of these wheat stem soft flies, give us a heads up. Um, if you're getting um, at harvest time or just prior to harvest, you see a lot of lodging happening, please let us know because we would like to come out and sample to see if we are seeing soft fly. Now, we've been talking about this for several years, actually, and, I've, and always asking folks to give us a heads up. And I really appreciate everybody who's given us a call and said, hey, we've got a lodging problem. We think we might see, be seeing something. One thing you'll see is there'll be pretty clean cut stems um, when it is lodging and it's going to be falling over um, just like right before harvest is ready to happen, it seems like. So again, if you notice that, even when you're out harvesting, just give us a call and we'll come out and collect some straw. And we would be looking down at the base of the plants. And so we'll collect those and see if we would have any soft fly that would hatch out of it. Although knock on wood, so far we have been in pretty good shape, but we've sure been on the lookout for this pest. Okay, we have Larry here. Um, sorry, Jeannie. <laughs> no, that's okay. Jump, jump ahead there. So we have Larry here, which, he, well, uh, I'm probably going to keep keep it pretty short and from an adaptability perspective. I think this is a variety that is better adapted as we go a little bit more towards the central part of the state, perhaps a little bit on the west edge of central Kansas there. And I like it also towards central Kansas better as far as youth record goes. I think uh, we, we saw some, some issues with uh, winter uh, kill on Larry in the past and so uh, in this region, I think it's uh, kind of too far northwest for where uh, where Larry is typically more widely adapted. 
But, but again, from the case state Manhattan breeding program, it's a very good variety for our South Central Kansas. Tatanka coming up next here as well. So this one is a variety out of the Hayes breeding program. He has had a very good yield record. He has a, very, a great yield potential actually. So high yield conditions does quite well, but he can lodge as well. So the greatest weaknesses that we have in Tatanka, one of the greatest weaknesses there is the straw strength. It doesn't offer a whole lot of standability there. Uh, medium maturity uh, here with, uh, with Tatanka, pretty decent drought stress. Because of that straw strength, we tried to position, position Tatanka more for a kind of like a, not, not your, your highest yield, yielding bottom ground, but more of like a tougher ground. It still can perform quite well, uh, quite stable there. Uh, with that said, again, we already discussed the Dallas and Western Star. They are probably better, better options there especially uh, Eric, because this one does not have WSM2 gene that we talked about, correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so Tatanka historically has been uh, quite vulnerable to wheat streak mosaic, uh, probably moderately susceptible there, also vulnerable to, uh, to leaf rust. Uh, so you might consider a fungicide if we know that leaf rust is active in the state. Uh, but uh, it's been holding up pretty well to, to stripe rust, however. So that's uh, been one, one plus on some of those Tatanka acres. So we're kind of switching gears here into some of the Lima grain varieties. Um, we have several that are kind of lined up here in alphabetical order. So we'll start here with LCS Avenger. Okay, well, LCS Avenger, uh, I think we had the chance to see it for, for at least a couple of years, I believe, uh, on this one. Uh, it's a T158 progeny there. Uh, however, it's not as early as what we have in T158, it's more of a medium sometimes even towards that medium late side of maturity there. Uh, pretty decent winter hardness on Avenger. Uh, straw strength is, is, is an improvement over 258 there as well. Uh, more of a Western Kansas, Eastern Colorado type of variety. Uh, medium tall. Uh, as far as, as, as yield record goes, I, I have not seen uh, how, how well it has performed there in Northwest Kansas. Lucas, do you have any comments there on its yield performance? Yeah, so we've, we've got to looking at the 18 and 19 data, eight, eight replicated trials and, and pretty middle of the pack. And so, uh, see, I don't know, I guess we'll kind of see what 2020 brings and maybe that will push us one way or the other off, off the fence. But uh, uh, see, I, I could see where people, you know, if, you, if, if T158 had worked in your system, I could see where Avenger might be a, a fit for that. Um, actually, though, in terms of the LCS lineup, I think we got Valent here a little bit later on. I'm probably more excited about it than I am Avenger. I agree, and it has um, a very upright growth pattern. You can kind of see that here in the in the pictures. Um, even as thick as this is, and many varieties we're not seeing the ground here in the Sherman County plots, you can look down the rows and see this, a very upright growth pattern, which you know, I kind of like something that will shade rows sometimes. So let's go ahead and jump ahead. Let's talk about LCS Chrome. Yeah, LCS Chrome has been around for a while now. Um, you know, whenever we look at the, the yield record for Chrome in Northwest Kansas, again, look at those two last years, it, it, it has been uh, kind of towards the bottom there uh, in Northwest Kansas. Uh, there are some of the things on, on the agronomy side that are favorable to Chrome there, like a pretty good straw strength, so sustainability is excellent there. It has a decent drought tolerance uh, on Chrome here. Uh, perhaps a little bit too late, so the maturity on it might be uh, considerably on the late side, although we think within the state of Kansas, uh, the, north, the far northwest is where a, a late maturing variety could capitalize on some grain field every now and then. So again, uh, it has some, some decent attributes from the agronomy side. Uh, and, and I believe Eric from the disease or, or Kelsey from the disease side as well, although the yield has really been towards the, the bottom of end there. Yeah, so just quickly here, you know, with the, the endorsement on the, the yield, maybe we don't want to say a whole lot there, but uh, it does uh, bring us some things to the table the, as far as leaf rust resistance. Uh, stripe rust resistance has been hanging in there pretty well, although we are seeing a little bit of evidence of, of some uh, erosion of, of that uh, type of resistance to st stripe rust. Uh, probably out there more than anything else, some of its instability uh, may be related to weed streak mosaic susceptibility and, and susceptibility to, to barley yellow dwarf. So 
you know, some of my ratings maybe differ a little bit from the Lima grain folks on, on some of these things, that particularly related to some of the viral diseases on barley yellow dwarf, but uh, pretty uh, widely accepted as, as susceptible to wheat streak mosaic. Okay, LCS Revere. Okay, with, uh, with Revere here, we have another T158 progeny, and these, in fact, actually looks quite a bit like T158 on the field. You have them side by side. They're actually very, very similar as far as their, 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 their visuals go and, and the type of heads and the type of tailoring and everything. Um, it is another medium-early maturing variety as well, so kind of similar to what we had in T158 there. Uh, it also has that type of similar type of reaction to, to drought stress. So remember that T158 is one that whenever we're going through drought or that drought and heat stress combination, it tends to slaughter the, the leaves off pretty quick. So it's really cashing in those resources from leaves and, and going into the stem and putting that to towards grain field. So T158 does that quite well. It's one mechanism of drought tolerance that it has. So it cashes in earlier uh, and seems like visually at least revered seems to do that as well. So um, again, we, I know they were talking about the Avenger being P158 progeny, but I think Revere has held a little bit better as far as yield record goes, and it's a little bit more similar to that P158. So perhaps for those growers who have worked with P158 before, Revere might be an option to take a look at as well. Uh, Kelsey or Eric, do you guys have any comments there on the disease package for Revere? So I think one key red flag would be again wheat streak mosaic. So that would be one to watch out for here and um, high susceptibility to leaf rust and stem rust. So it's important again to scout this one and those would be just, just very key watch outs. So we've mentioned uh, Valiant already. Um, you know, we go, only got one year of, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. We've seen it a couple years now in the performance test um, and really have seen some uh, exceptional yields come out of it. Um, gets us into that medium, medium early maturity. Uh, maybe not quite as, as tall as a person would like, but uh, excellent straw strength with it. Um, so I don't know, we'll see how it does here in 20, but this is, is certainly one I've got, uh, I think we need to keep an eye on that uh, could have, uh, you know, be fairly broadly adapted and, and I think could be a good fit for a lot of folks. So um, early, early indicators are good. And this one might look a little better. So this has some stem rust resistance. So we like to see that, although just intermediate to leaf rust and stripe rust. So you still might might need to think about a fungicide application for, for this one in certain years, and then susceptible to wheat streak mosaic. So making sure that, um, that neighbors are managing volunteer wheat, um, and then maybe there might be other option if, if that's not, if that's not um, something that can be done. Okay, so we have here TM114, and we'll follow it right up with TM115. So um, we have 114 in all four of the wheat plots across the area. We have 115 in two of our wheat plots. Yeah, so I mean, interesting to note here, we really have uh, uh, two different genetic families. 114 has TAM 111 in its background. And so if you remember from a drought tolerance standpoint, uh, 111 uh, uh, and its derivatives tend to have a little better uh, root water extraction and in terms of able to access more waters, how they deal with, uh, and, and are typically better able to deal with pr more prolonged drought situations. Um, and then, uh, so TAM 115, which, which goes back to TAM 112, more of an above ground drought tolerance trait where they just more tightly regulate how much water vapor uh, uh, can pass through uh, the leaves. We've not had a, a much look at all at TAM 115 yet, yeah, in terms of yield data or anything, uh, as opposed to TAM 114, uh, which has done really well in the, the last several years in the, in the performance test. And so it's been a nice fit in that medium maturity range uh, as a replacement for uh, TAM 111 and, uh, and had certainly improved plant health characteristics over, over 111 as well. So one thing I will comment on, I think TAM 114 was getting a little bit of an unfair rap this spring after the freeze. Um, in terms of uh, you know being maybe being more susceptible, and I guess I'd really caution folks in terms of how much weight do you put in. We've seen a lot of really weird things this year in terms of how stuff reacted to the freeze, and uh, and a lot of it was timing, and uh, and a lot of little 
little differences in management made big differences in terms of freeze injury. And so uh, I guess I'm certainly, I'm certainly not throwing TAM 114 off my short list just because of what we saw in a few places this spring. Should we comment on the disease package on these two varieties? Sure, yeah. Well, so I know for TAM 114, um, one key watch out or a couple key watch outs is that it is susceptible to soil borne mosaic. And I know, Eric, you've seen these varieties more than me. So if you have any comments, jump on in. But um, I think it's for the rest of these diseases that we've been talking about leaf rust, stem rust, stripe rust, a tan spot, it has a pretty intermediate, so pretty much the average of the test um, uh, susceptibility, but maybe I'll let Eric make his sage comments on this one. Sage comments, huh? That means I'm the old guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just joking. The, uh, probably the, the leaf rust, I would definitely say is intermediate. You know, one of the things that's interesting, uh, just as we've watched TAM 114 over the last few years here, is that I was very concerned yes, last year where it seemed like uh, we were seeing some stripe rust earlier on, on TAM 114. But interestingly, I think this is one that maybe has some adult plant type of resistance. So as we get to the heading, flowering, and grain fill stages of, of growth, it seems like the resistance that uh, is present in the, uh, the TAM 114 does seem to work better. And uh, those stripe rust lesions seem to, to dry up and, and lose a lot of their sporulation or that bright orange reproduction of the fungus that's uh, so evident in, in highly susceptible varieties. So, you know, even though we, we kind of end up with that intermediate to moderately resistant reaction, it's, it's mostly because of early vulnerabilities uh, that I think is, has helped us out on, on the TAM 114. Any comments on disease package on 115? So on the disease package here, I, I was looking at this one uh, uh, just recently also and, and saw that the TAM uh, 115 is uh, another one of those that looks like it has some uh, of the WSM2 type of background and maybe even some wheat curl mite resistance. So definitely don't have a lot of my own experience uh, with it, but uh, uh, Texas A&M is reporting uh, some resistance uh, to wheat streak mosaic to uh, stripe rust and leaf rust. So, you know, I, I think with the success of some of the, the TAM 111, 112, 114 out there, I think this one would be something I'd want to keep an eye on to see how it does for uh, in the plots this year. And this one is a new release. Um, we had to twist some arms to get uh, the wheat plot seed for us so we could get 115 in for a couple of plots. Um, but it's been pretty exciting to kind of watch it go in many cases is planted right along TAM 114 and we know that it has very different parent parental lines. At the same time, it's been kind of fun to watch, watch new varieties come out like this. Okay, so we'll again kind of switch gears and we'll start into the West spread varieties and we're going to start with um, WB Grainfield, which is a variety um, that we have a lot of farmers who like quite a bit um, and we've seen for a few years here. Yeah, I think Grainfield, uh, Ginny, as you mentioned, has been around for a while. I think since 2012, I remember right, its release was. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, you know, it has uh, had a good reason for having been around for a while and, and very very widely adapted among growers. Uh, it, it has a pretty, uh, very decent yield record. If we look back at the last few years only, seems like we're getting some other varieties out yielding it in our trials. It's been that middle of the pack, more or less, last couple of years or, or three years in a row there for Northwest Kansas. But it still brings a pretty good uh, drought tolerance to the table. Uh, it, it leaves a good amount of residue behind. It has a good yield potential if you manage for it as well. Uh, so uh, maturity wise, you know, it depends where we're giving the ratings, but uh, and of course against what other varieties we're looking at it, but seems like it's going to head out more or less as a medium type of maturity variety. Sometimes it can even look as a medium late heading out, but it finishes fast. So it goes through the grain tilling period actually quite, quite fast. And so uh, it tends to, to finish as a medium early maturing variety. So probably a medium type of maturity there. Is one that I still have on my short list. I think still yields quite well, puts out some very large heads up to 40, 45 kernels in a head there. Uh, so again, one that I still would have on my, my short list. Maybe one of the reasons we don't see the yield record on our K-State anymore, 
that we've seen in the past. Uh, Kelsey, perhaps, has to do with its uh, disease package. Yeah, so um, Greenfield is widely adapted, but it ha does come with some vulnerabilities on the disease side. Uh, it's fairly susceptible across the board, so it does have high, pretty high susceptibility to wheat streak mosaic, um, and then also to leaf and stripe rust, and also to the septoria and tan spotting, some of those foliar, um, foliar disease issues. So it's definitely one that um, if you do choose to plant it, it's one to scout and make sure that it, it might need some management to get that top end yield potential. So you might need to apply a fungicide or else you're gonna have a lot of those, um, those diseases nibbling away at yield. This is also one that I seem to, every once in a while get, seem, I get calls that somebody asks, is it more susceptible to wheat streak mosaic? than anything else, but um, I had a call this year and they had the rest, the remainder of the field was planted to Avery and the edge was planted to grain field and you could see a stark difference in wheat streak mosaic resistance on those two. Yeah, from what I understand, it doesn't have any, any resistance to um, wheat streak mosaic. So that, that makes sense. You would, if it's there, you're gonna see it in grain field. Is that right, Eric? Yeah, it is. Uh, grain field turns a bright yellow color in response to uh, to wheat streak mosaic, so it can get your attention in the hur in a hurry when exposed to that virus. And I think the bright yellow is what was catching some attention for sure. We'll, we'll spend a lot of time on Winterhawk. Uh, maybe the oldest variety uh, in here yet. I you know still on a lot of acres in Northwest Kansas. Uh, unfortunately, it's not entered in the yield trials anymore, so we don't really have data to, to go off of, but uh, I don't know, we'll, uh, we'll kind of see producers become the judge at some point in terms of how fast they rotate something out. And so uh, still, I think, pretty top shelf in terms of drought tolerance, but as newer stuff comes out, maybe not quite the competitiveness on yield anymore. Part of the reason I put this in is because I have some growers who want something that they know well to compare some of the new varieties to. And so that's part of the reason that Winterhawk, I continue to put in some of our plots. It's almost, it's not our Czech variety, but it is the variety that everybody knows well to compare to. I think that's great. Yeah. So 4418, a fairly new release uh, from Westbred. And uh, so while not, uh, necessarily solid stem or even uh, semi-solid stem. It does have some, some more a thicker stem wall um, and, and some other things that make it non-preferential to soft fly. And so in trials further north, they've seen a little less soft fly uh, uh, infestation in it. Uh, in terms of our yield records here in Northwest Kansas, it's been pretty middle of the pack, uh, but it is regarded for excellent straw strength and, and its height. Um, if you are considering irrigated wheat, it might be a, a good fit uh, in that uh, that type of system. Yeah, I think 4418 is one that um, is thought to have very good wheat streak mosaic um, resistance. So I, I'd be curious. I haven't seen it so much because it's it's new and I'm new too. But I think it um, it should be one of those that has a good disease package too. It seems to be holding up pretty well to stripe rust, although we, like like I said before, we like to see that in, in the K-State um, screening nurseries, the USDA screening nurseries, but overall I think it, it's kind of an exciting disease package. So this, this is one we're gonna watch in the, in the pathology program. Real quick, can we take just a quick uh, kind of a commercial here? When you're talking about these nurseries, are these nurseries that are actually inoculated specifically for stripe rust? Yeah, so the USDA um, and specifically Bob Bowden um, and his team run a few different nurseries. So they have a stem rust nursery that's here in Manhattan, stripe rust nursery um, that's out east of Manhattan, and then a, uh, a couple leaf rust nurseries. And so they inoculate, Eric, you jump in anytime and you just correct me if I'm wrong, but they'll inoculate with, with several different um, different isolates of, of each of these, um, each of these rusts. So uh, from that, we can really be kind of in a worst case scenario, how bad these varieties are going to perform where they're really being hit with, with any of the rusts that they're gonna see um, out in the field. So that's a really useful note for us. 
Yeah, I think the main goal of these USDA trials is, is to uh, provide uniform disease pressure or, or severe disease, uh, largely to support the breeding program. So there's, there's very few varieties that uh, are, are now growing in the Great Plains that haven't come through these uh, disease screening nurseries. So they serve a very important role in, in helping identify and uh, uh, bring new disease resistance traits into our into our varieties here that we grow in, in the state. So uh, we're really thankful for that opportunity to, to look at a lot of experimental lines, but also uh, some of the varieties we're currently growing in, in the state. It gives us a very uniform and, and high disease pressure situation. And make it through these, uh, they're gonna make it in your fields. And do they, do they miss the variety? I mean, do they miss the plots to keep them wet so it's all the right conditions for rust to take effect? They do have that capacity to do that. Uh, it depends on the year. If it's a, a really dry year, uh, they will go ahead and uh, mist irrigate it or, or use a little bit of supplemental irrigation just at uh, key times to try and keep the disease going. Uh, usually conditions uh, are favorable enough uh, as far east as these nurseries are that uh, they uh, uh, seem to allow the disease to develop on their on their own, uh, they just uh, put the fungus in the right place and, and get it started early so that the, the disease has plenty of time to, to build up. Um, in most situations, these nurseries are, are so far east that they're uh, considerably away from the major wheat producing areas of the state. So we think the, the risk that it poses to Kansas wheat production is, is very low relative to the, the amount of return that the growers get for the, uh, the added benefit of identifying new sources of resistance. Great. I didn't mean to take us off topic. It just seems like we've talked about those a couple of different times and, you know, I'm sure growers are curious of how the, that screening is done. Yeah, so it's good. It's good for us, especially, um, you know, for the breeding program, but like Eric mentioned, you know, some of these released, for example, Westbred varieties, they might, um, in their own screening nurseries, screen against a certain race or isolate of, um, of striped rust, for example. But now we get to see it against some of the isolates that we know are here in the High Plains region um, and, and a certain high level. So we can kind of validate this data too, which I think is, is a pretty a good service. Very much so. Okay, so let's continue on talking about wheat varieties. WB4462. Yes, I don't think we'll spend very much time on this. Uh, it was introduced a few years ago as a replacement for winter hawk. Never really lived up to that. Uh, it's been pretty, pretty average in the yield trials. Um, frankly, I think uh, within the West Red lineup, we'll see 4792 here in a minute. I think that's a lot more interesting probably than, than 4462. WB4595. Yeah, so 4595 is a, is a newer one out of West Fred. So again, if we just review the, the numbering system quite briefly there, the first number four, it just stands, just tells us that it is a hard red winter wheat. Uh, second number there, the five tells us the maturity. So one would be an early maturing variety, nine being a late maturing variety. So five tells us it's a medium maturity variety. The nine tells us the year of release. So starting last year, so the nine there tells it's in 2019. And then the last number is just, is just a random number. So 4595, a medium maturing variety released last year. That's what we can tell by, by its name. Uh, has a pretty good straw strength, pretty good standability there. Uh, decent winter hardness as well. Seems to have a good drought tolerance. Uh, so I think we need to see how, how it's going to do. Last year, it did not shine in our trials. It was actually below average as far as uh, Northwest Kansas go. So, uh, but they are putting this one as a Western adapted variety because it doesn't have soil borne mosaic and it doesn't have acid soil tolerance. So it is more of a Western variety, but I think we're still wanting to, to take a closer look and see where it's going to be. Uh, Eric, any comments there on the disease rating for this one? Yeah, so this is one that, uh, again, we don't have a lot of experience with just yet. Uh, it looks like uh, West Brad would like to suggest that it's uh, going to be intermediate to leaf rust, but a little better, moderately resistant to, to stripe rust, uh, intermediate to moderately susceptible, nothing special on the wheat streak side. So, yeah, a little probably more concerned about uh, the its overall yield and, and productivity here uh, of being average right out of the 
uh, release year there. So uh, let's see what this one does this year. And, and uh, but with such a strong uh, lineup of new varieties, it seems like uh, things are going to be awfully competitive here over the next few years. Okay, here's 4792. So 4792 is another new one, again, that 9 tells us it was released last year. The 7 tells us a little bit later maturing than what we have in the previous variety there. So this is going to be a medium-late maturing variety. Excellent standability on this one. So the, the, the straw strength is, is great on this one. I've seen it stand up against some other varieties that uh, were lodging under very high unit conditions, and 4792 is actually standing up quite well. Uh, it's another Western variety because it doesn't have the soil-borne mosaic virus, so for that region of the state, it might be a pretty good fit. Uh, yield record has been very good as well, though we only have one year of record. It did uh, do very well last year. So this one that I'll, I'll probably be taking a closer, uh, a closer look at. Uh, I'm curious to see where the yield is going to stand this year. Uh, again, that good drought tolerance, good stability, medium-late maturity might be a good fit for, for Northwest Kansas there. Uh, what about uh, it's uh, it's disease package there, Kelsey. What uh, what are we seeing on 4792? Yeah, so we're also looking forward to seeing this more um, in the coming years. But I think an important thing to, to note is that it uh, 4792 is susceptible to soil borne mosaic, so it's positioned to be placed um, in in more western varieties and um, western locations. Um, it's it's more susceptible to wheat streak mosaic than more resistant. Now I've been talking about these varieties too much. It's more resistant to wheat streak mosaic, um, which I think is a good thing, and it's it's being advertised as as resistant or moderately resistant to stripe rust. So overall, a, a pretty promising disease package, except for that soil borne mosaic, which could be a big concern. Um, and also fusarium head blight, so it's susceptible to fusarium head blight, which could some in some years be a concern. But like I. That this is going to be one that we'll have to keep an eye on. I would just add these pictures here were taken uh, Saturday and, and Sunday when um, the rest of these pictures were also taken and so um, 4792 kind of needs to kick it in gear a little bit here um, on its heading and get to moving if we're having um, really warm temperatures coming for the next week or so. So um, we were seeing just starting you can see the picture down in the center um, labeled Cheyenne County. That's kind of what the Wallace County plot over at EH Farms look like and what the Cheyenne County plot also look like. So um, they maybe need to move a little bit quicker, although Sherman County was pretty fully headed. So a little bit of difference that you can see there in the differences in plots. Yeah, that's a very good comment there, Jeannie. And uh, it, it brings something that I failed to mention as well. But this year, that freeze damage that we saw and Lucas was talking about before that we saw them 114 get hit pretty hard. 4792 was one that we also saw get hit pretty hard on that freeze in, in several locations that I took a look at it. Uh, I think based on talking to some of the West Bread folks as well, it seems like it takes on that spring growth a little bit earlier, but then it just takes it a longer time later in the cycle. And so we were seeing it get, uh, maybe that's what happened here. Maybe if it got hurt a little bit more by that freeze, you need to retrieve any, any energy that it still had to start producing healers, right? So that could be something that causing even a later maturity now for heading out on, on these. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. And I would tell you just looking at the Cheyenne County plot, mostly because it's close and handy for me to swing by and look at, um, it did get hit fairly hard, I would say, with the, the freeze on it. Um, I had one farmer ask me if, if we were trying to kill it off out there because there wasn't a lot of green coming back from it. So it's done a lot, it's had a lot of growth since April when we really burnt a lot of top growth back on it. Okay, so we'll switch gears again here. We just finished with West Bread. Now we'll look at some AgriPro varieties. So um, many of these you'll be able to see in the Sherman County plot and at the ENH plot in Wallace County. And so here is SY Grit. Yeah, so I agree that I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this one, Jeannie, mostly because uh, it was released as a post-rock background, post-rock replacement, so more of a like north-central Kansas type of variety. We look at the yield record of Greek in western Kansas, although it has a 
this is drought tolerance. The yield record just isn't really there. And so it's mostly towards the, 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 the lower end, like below average the last three years or two years uh, of yield data that we have on Greek uh, in Northwest Kansas there. So uh, we'll probably keep the comments on this one quite short so we can uh, probably talk about more adapted varieties there. So. Okay, so we'll just move right on to SY Legend CL2. So this is also a two gene clear field that we've been talking about a little bit more. Roman yes, so, I'm sorry. No, I just, I, I don't think uh, we'll probably spend a, a whole lot of time on it just because I think in, in Sunflower District, I think uh, the bird CL2 is probably going to be a more adapted variety and, and uh, our yield trial data in Western Kansas would, would kind of indicate that as well. Okay. SY Monument. So SY Monument is a quite broadly adapted variety, similar to what we talked about with uh, grain field, WB grain field being quite broadly adapted. Monument is one of those as well that takes several acres. It's actually for a couple of years in a row, most widely planted wheat in, in Kansas there. And so several reasons for that. Uh, pretty good feathering ability, a decent drought tolerance, has good acid soil tolerance as we go towards more central Kansas environments there. Uh, medium to medium late maturity uh, might be a little bit weak on the knees there if we have a lot of very high fertility conditions. Um, so it has thrived quite a bit on late planted systems, right? Late planted after soybeans in our central Kansas, for example. Now, as we move as far west as we are here, uh, we might, we probably have options that have a better drought uh, tolerance than, than SY Monument, but that's one that has worked well in, in a very, very broad adaptability throughout the state. Uh, Kelsey, some of the disease things on Monument there that could have helped it have this broad adaptability or what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so overall, SY Monument has a, has a good disease package. So particularly when we're talking about um, tan spot or septoria, some of those leaf spotting diseases, and also stripe rust, stem rust, and leaf rust. So this is a good one if you want to avoid that, that fungicide input and put most of the resistance uh, in the seed, that, that's a good option. Um, although this is one, Eric's pointed this out, that seems to be slipping a little bit um, with its stripe rust resistance, so it might be a little more susceptible than it had been a couple of years back, and that's because the pathogen is changing a little bit. So it's one we're, we're actively watching. One red flag with SY Monument is it is susceptible to wheat streak mosaic, so that might be a concern um, uh, and might cause it to get some yield hits in, in certain years. So just something to think about for, for this one. Okay, SY Rugged. Yeah, so SY Rugged, uh, I think is another one that we probably don't need to spend a lot of time on it. I mean, if we look at the yield record for Northwest Kansas, it has been pretty much on the average of the pack there for the last three years. We just look at the last two years, same thing, and last year again. So it's consistently there on the average, right? Um, so, so probably we don't need to spend a lot of time here, Jeannie. I think it's probably a better fit as we move perhaps to Southwest Kansas. Uh, there because of its medium early maturity variety might be a better fit. Although the yield record there also has been right there on average uh, across the board. So we'll probably have a better fit for, 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 the, for the region. Okay, so let's try SY Wolverine. Yeah, so Wolverine's going to be fairly late maturing. Uh, it's got wolf in its background and so I guess I'm I'm probably, uh, as we think about across the Sunflower District, I'm a lot more comfortable with Wolverine in Cheyenne County than I am in Wallace County. And uh, it's, it's just enough of a difference there, even, even with elevation. Um, I guess I'd be curious to see how it does, you know, like down on Mize and, and uh, on purposes this year. Uh, you know, in the variety trials, uh, in the Colby, Colby and Tridman trials, it's done well. Um, and so I guess we continue to kind of see how it, how it pans out, but it's certainly going to be towards the later end of of maturity. Excellent straw strength on it though, leaves nice stubble, and uh, so there are some things to, to like about it. Uh, but in general, I see it being a better fit in, in Cheyenne than, than further south. Okay, how about the disease package on SY Wolverine? So that's why Wolverine uh, with that wolf and, and Everest kind of background is, is interesting. It doesn't bring much to the table on the stripe rust uh, side of things, uh, considerably better for leaf rust, however. So that's a, a big plus. 
Uh, probably not going to be anything special for wheat streak mosaic or barley yellow dwarf, uh, some real problems out in, in your neck of the woods. So uh, keep an eye on the, the wheat streak mosaic and uh, the stripe rust susceptibility, but uh, I've been pleased with uh, many things I've seen out of Wolverine for, for that north central northwest area. Great. Okay. So we've finished with all of our red weeds and we have um, probably the largest collection of white weeds that go into county demo plots between our wheat plots down at my farms and then they're in Sherman County F and J farms. So we're just going to dive right into white wheat varieties here. Okay, so let's start with Antero. Yes, yeah, so Antero really doesn't need much introduction. I mean, it was the top yielding wheat for a lot of years in Western Kansas, both red or white. Uh, TAM 11 background, uh, pretty average quality. That's kind of was one of the things that, that did it in eventually is it's just very much a commodity class uh, type wheat. There's newer stuff out of CSU's program and then Joe from K-State overtook it in terms of, of yield potential. So I don't know, I think we've, we've probably seen a lot of those acres shift away from Antero, even though one time it was, it was the wheat to beat. I agree. Okay, how about Breck? So Breck's a new release from CSU. Uh, it's got uh, Denali and Antero in its background. Uh, it's part of the Ardent Mills uh, IP program. So, uh, uh, you know, so it's got some excellent milling and baking quality, but uh, you'll need to be lined up with uh, delivery point and contracts in order to use it. Uh, medium early maturity, medium height, excellent. Um, excellent might be a strong word. Very good straw strength on it though. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, in terms of adapted varieties to get into the Art Mills IP, it's it's a pretty good pick. How about a disease package with Breck? Yeah, I think this one is is again new to us. Uh, it seems to have good stem rust, stripe rust, and leaf rust resistance. Eric, I know we saw this yesterday, but now I'm trying to remember how this was doing on the on the leaf rust side of things. Um, yeah, I guess I was trying to, to look back through our notes too. It does look like uh, some of the first we've been able to see it would be in some of these USDA nurseries that we had seen before where I was uh, noting that some of our, our stripe rust was, was suggesting maybe a little more vulnerability than what Colorado was initially uh, suggesting and, and uh, leaf rust. Uh, I think the, the verdict is still out yet. So uh, I think this is a, a white wheat we want to keep an eye on, but uh, uh, let's also uh, try and get some more disease observations to make sure we know what we're working with. Okay, how about Monarch? So Monarch, another uh, new release out of, or fairly new release out of CSU, an 18 release. Uh, it's got snow mass in its background, so it's trying to go after some quality with it. Uh, not part of an IP program, uh, but it does have a very good quality. Um, it's done as certified seed only. Uh, excellent straw strength, and, and my understanding is they're kind of positioning it maybe a little more under irrigation. And so uh, that might maybe tells you something a little bit about its drought tolerance. So is it a uh, Ardent Mills uh, variety? Uh, as I understand it, it's not part of the Ardent Mills IP program. It, it could be grown as a, uh, it's not part of the IP program, but yet it is still a certified seed only. Okay. It's a, a low PPO content is one of the, I think one of the things it brings to, to the milling and baking market. Okay. And again, we want to see this one more. It is new. Um, said to have good stripe rust resistance and soil borne resistance. But I think like some of these others, we're going to need some more, some more Kansas based notes. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Eric. Yeah, I think you're right on target. It's, it's been kind of a mixed bag, mixed bag in some of these uh, nursery screenings. Uh, some places it looks a little more moderately resistant, others uh, maybe drifting towards uh, intermediate. So kind of depending on, on the location and, and what's going on. Okay. Clara CL. Yeah, so Clara might, well, it might be giving Winterhawk a run for its money in terms of the oldest variety in, in the trial. Um, yes. What makes Clara unique is if you're needing a clear field white, Clara is your basically only option. And uh, so I think that's kind of uh, kind of what it's bringing. I can't remember. Is there another reason uh, Mize have it in there? I can't remember if there's something else about that they like. Well, it's a white wheat that does have uh, the 
uh, WSM2 resistance to weak streak mosaic as well. So it, it may be useful for from that perspective also. Okay. Joe, we've mentioned Joe a couple of times as we've been talking about white wheats. Yeah, so uh, Joe here, a, a more recent release than some of these, uh, sort of for sure, compared to Platter there, for sure, and, and, and some of the other ones that we talked about here. But the excellent yield record in Western Kansas. So really, whenever we talk about white wheat and high yields, Joe is definitely one to keep on the, on the short list there. Uh, it, it has a very good drought tolerance as well, good straw strength, maturity wise. Straw strength on it, 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 it's good, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to go down. I mean, it can hold very, very high yields on it, but it, it might lean there some years. Um, very high tillering variety. I've seen it planted in, under low populations, resulting in a very large number of heads there. So pretty good tillering, uh, tillering variety. Um, let's see, quality on it is, is, is average. We're probably not going to get into an IP program with Joe here because it, it's not an excellent quality, but it's not poor either. It's more and more of, a, as Lucas mentioned, type of a commodity wheat type of, of, uh, of quality there. But uh, overall, excellent yield record. And Eric, I believe uh, some, some very decent attributes from the disease side as well. Yeah, Joe has really had an excellent uh, disease package overall. So I think uh, it's known to have good leaf rust and, and leaf spot type of resistance. Uh, wheat streak mosaic has that WSM2 gene that we've described. So one of the, the white wheats that uh, really is agronomically top of the class uh, as far as yield and productivity uh, looks pretty strong. Uh, Stripe rust has also been quite good over the years. What uh, maybe one caveat like Kelsey and, and I have mentioned earlier is this is one where we've seen maybe a little more stripe rust uh, uh, coming on Joe in last year, uh, late in the season, and, and now this year again. So uh, let's keep an eye on that and, and make sure we don't get any surprises uh, mid-season on the Joe. One, uh, while we're on topic of Joe, one thing in far western Kansas we need to remember, uh, it's got a medium short curly uptile. And so we don't want to plant it early into warm soils that will fully sh uh, uh, further shorten that. And then uh, if you're in a, a tillage type production system and using a hoe drill, we just need to be conscious that uh, burying this thing too deep, you may not end up with the stands that, that you would like to have. So plant some other varieties first and uh, uh, it's still uh, still a lot of yield potential there. It's, it's still a variety worth having in the lineup. Just got to be aware of that one limitation. We'll, we'll spend a lot of time on Venata. Uh, really, Joe, you know, what it has over Joe is a little bit uh, an improvement in milling and baking quality, yield-wise and drought tolerance. I think Joe's going to be pretty solidly ahead of Venata. I think this is, is probably better positioned in, in areas east of the Sunflower District. And the same would be true for Silverado, really more targeted to try and open up the white wheat market in, in central Kansas. Um, and I, I just, I don't think it's got the drought tolerance that it needs to uh, to hang out out here in the western part of the state. I don't, I don't know if Ron Lowe or Eric, you guys got thoughts on that as well, but that's my take on it. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I think that's, that's my understanding on it as well. I mean, both Venata and Silverado. I think Venata even had the soil borne mosaic, and so the idea is to move a little bit more into central Kansas with, with these varieties. So. I would tell you as I'm walking through the plots, Silverado catches my eye because it has kind of a dark green, kind of silvery look to it almost. As, as I'm walking through plots, it, con it catches my attention. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm drawn to dark green varieties and maybe this is one of them that catches my attention a little bit closer here. So, okay. So, oh, one more, LCS Yeti. Yeah, so, uh, do you wanna go for it, Luca? No, I, I was just gonna say, I, I have no basis to talk about it. I really haven't seen much of it and had not uh, seen any data on it. Yeah, and I'll be honest with you, uh, I'm more or less in the same boat that you that you are there. Uh, my understanding there, uh, kind of like a, a very good, I mean, they, they step up from Joe here would be more on the milling and baking side. Uh, originally, they were thinking that's going to have a pretty good straw strength and could hold on there with you uh, comparable to Joe. But I haven't seen much of it, really. I don't know. I haven't seen much of the of the yields on these varieties really being comparable to, to Joe or not. So... Uh, yeah, I don't have much much information other than that. 
I think that is sure enough. That is our last one. Do you guys have um, parting comments on things that growers should think about as they're going through and selecting a variety? What are some of the key characteristics or what, where should they be going to help get information to select new varieties? So I think, uh, you know, we've demonstrated this at your pre-plant -pre wheat schools, Jeannie, but, uh, you know, a tool we use to, to pull a lot of this data together is ramwheatdb.com. The where Colorado State assembles the performance test data and, and from all the states. And, and I think this is especially important for growers in the, in the Sunflower District to look not only at, uh, you know, obviously the Colby and Tribune performance test data is relevant, but also to look at, uh, you know, Burlington and Sheridan Lake and kind of take a, a little broader uh uh, regional view, you know, more site, especially these new ones just coming onto the market. Um, you know, you need to need to look at a few more locations to get enough numbers to, to have some confidence in. So that's a, a really nice tool. I think it's important to keep, you know, think about your wheat varieties. It's kind of like your investment portfolio. They tell you to be diversified. And so I think diversity in, in genetic background, diversity in maturity, um, I think those are important concepts to keep in mind. Rummel, are those other things that you think growers should think about when they're selecting new varieties? Yeah, I think uh, I'll agree with Lucas there. Definitely review the performance, not only in a single location, but several locations. And have in mind also the cropping system that we are working with, right? Uh, of course, for you guys in Western Kansas, drought tolerance is, is the number one trait that you need to be looking for. Uh, but then as we move more like Southwest Kansas, you, we have, we get into some grazing lands and things along those lines. And so uh, what was the cropping system, right? Uh, when is going to be the planting date? Are you going to be pushing planting dates later because you're going to plant after a summer, a summer crop, like a corn, for example, right? You, you might need even a better drought tolerance in that case because the profile is likely going to be depleted. Definitely something that tillers quite well, and maybe something towards the early side of maturity because we're already planting quite late, right? So uh, just just uh, having, we have so many varieties out there today that we can really be picky and, and choose those varieties that really fits the system that we are working with. So uh, definitely go after information, not only the RAM database, but uh, we have our own publication on these varieties where we're putting out every year, uh, where we compile the, all the notes that we have not only from the current year, but from a history of several years in a row there. So we put out the information on variety maturity and adaptability in the state and things along those lines. Definitely be on the lookout for, for that information from a K-State agronomy. Okay. Yeah, so that information is going to be uh, embedded in some of the uh, right our package right along with some of the disease ratings also. So, you know, we, uh, Kelsey and I talked a lot about uh, stripe rust, leaf rust, uh, weed speak mosaic that are so important for your area. There's a lot of great tools that are out there just in the genetics that you select for your variety. So one of the, the key things you can do to lower your disease risk and maybe even avoid a, a additional input costs from fungicides is to uh, take a little time to investigate what uh, what's the latest genetics, pick for high yielding varieties that have uh, the best uh, resistance that you have available to you, and uh, you'll be uh, a, a big step ahead than, than many of your, your counterparts out there. Okay, great. Okay, so um, just to kind of close this out, so our um, wheat variety booklets that you typically will get at Wheat Plot Tour, which has some kind of key characteristics of things that we'd be looking for in Western Kansas, are all compiled into what you'll see when you walk through the wheat plot. And so I encourage you all either go online and download that wheat booklet or stop by the wheat plot and pick it up. And all those wheat plots have been mowed in front of so you can easily walk in through them. Um, spend just a little bit of time walking through and looking at these wheat plots. You can see some of the differences um, as we go across this, um, across the area. Because I want, you know, it's one thing to hear about these varieties sitting in front of a computer listening to us talk about them. It's, it's a good thing to go out into the field and see them and touch them and, and get more familiar with what you're seeing out there in the field. So um, I encourage you guys to go ahead and do that. Um, the plot results for our wheat demo plots and for the performance test 
for Colby Tribune over in Colorado will all be available at the at the fairs this year and so we will have a display set up with the um, we'll have baggies of each variety that we harvested um, from our demo plots and we'll have all the results for across the area and so I think it's a really good um, important thing to stop and take go in and walk through and look at, at those um, varieties there at the fair also in those samples. So um, I had one farmer who asked me a quick question and I'm kind of ambushing you guys here just a little bit but he Lucas he was asking me about wheat varieties and protein content. I told him a lot of, ha a lot of it had to do with nitrogen management and um, what mother nature had thrown at us. Can, so can you give us just a Cliff Notes version talking about, uh, talking about uh, protein content? Sure, so I think there's, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about this a lot in the past. If you kind of think about uh, three knobs, you know, in terms of what we can use to control uh, or what controls protein content in wheat, you know, the biggest knob out there is environment. We don't have a lot of control over that. And so, because what we're really talking about is the, the dilution effect. As we grow more grain, uh, you know, the proteins laid down first in the kernel. So if we have a really good grain fill condition, we keep adding more starch. And so protein as a percentage of the whole uh, gets diluted out. So we don't have a lot of control over environment. Now on a management standpoint, we do have control from the nitrogen standpoint. And so we need to keep in mind that yield is made first, uh, really before uh, before there's enough left over to, make, to ensure we have enough for, for protein. And so, you know, a good rule of thumb here, um, and, and if you get protein grades back from your elevator, um, you know, over the long haul, 11.5% protein, if you're consistently under 11.5%, that's a pretty good sign that you, not only did you not have enough nitrogen to make protein, but you also probably left yield on the table as well. And so if you're consistently under 11.5%, that's probably a pretty good indicator that your nitrogen program's a little bit on the short side. Um, so. So that's that. Now the third piece, and some people get, you know, tied up in, in variety, and, and we do know there are some differences amongst variety, but it's important to remember that those differences are pretty minor. Uh, you know, a lot of times people say, okay, well, this had this protein and that had that protein, but if you're not comparing them at the same yield level, um, you're, you're not really getting the full picture there. Uh, I think Romulo mentioned earlier, I think in some of their work, I think it's Chrome, he said, tends to have a little higher protein when compared to other stuff at, uh, at the same yield level. Uh, we know there's some other varieties that you know, tend to be uh, above or, or under, but it's important to remember variety selection is, is not going to be you know, a one and a half, two percent difference in, in protein. We're talking about this variety component being very small relative to the nitrogen management piece and the environment piece. So I, I, I would hesitate to say go pick a variety just based on protein. I think you pick a variety for disease and yield and drought tolerance and then you manage it appropriately to get to protein. Romulo, do you have some comments to go with that? Yeah, no, I think Lucas covered it quite well. Uh, the, the ability that we have to control protein based on varieties is, is much smaller than the environment or the nitrogen management. Uh, we, we, although, I mean, uh, although that's, that's quite true, these varieties, they, they differ in the milling and baking quality. So maybe that's something to, more than, than what they do in protein. So maybe that's something to look at, you know, pick a variety that has a history of good milling and baking quality. If you're going to uh, be able to capitalize on that, like a niche market or something along those lines where you get paid for quality as well. Uh, and then you manage your nitrogen to get to that milling and baking quality. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you guys for answering that question. Um, Eric and Kelsey, one thing that we have kind of thrown in as we've talked about varieties has been stem rust. How concerned should farmers be about stem rust? You know, we hear the horror stories from our grandparents talking about um, black rust and stem rust. Is this something that our generation should be worried about? Well, I think as we look historically at what's been going on with, with stem rust uh, in our region is, like you said, our uh, a generation of, of wheat growers before, wheat breeders uh, that are just beginning to enter their retirement years have, have uh, many of them had direct experience with, uh, with stem rust as one of their early, uh, early memories, either early in their career as a farmer or as a, a agronomist or, or wheat breeder. And, 
And uh, there were reports and what I've read are pretty awful. And uh, there was a huge effort to try and breed resistance because at one time this was the number one disease in, in uh, the Great Plains. So we haven't fortunately had to deal with a lot of stem rust and a lot of it's been uh, uh, leveraging or, or capitalizing on that investment that our uh, wheat breeders and, and uh, pathologists made uh, a generation ago. So we've been kind of living on, on that for quite some time. It's been very stable uh, that we haven't had to deal with this, but I'm concerned that we're letting that erode away as, as we've uh, started with just a few varieties a few years ago that were uh, vulnerable. And, and now it seems like we're at a point where uh, we're maybe 30, uh, maybe approaching 40% of our acres in Western Kansas that are, are susceptible to moderately susceptible to this disease. So uh, I'm a little concerned. We've opened the door to something here that, that maybe uh, this generation of farmers and, and, and uh, growers and, and wheat breeders maybe just hasn't experienced. So uh, I don't know exactly where it's going. I don't know, uh, uh, but I can just tell you that the, the vulnerability is there, maybe like we haven't experienced for us uh, for several decades. Now, I think we could use fungicides if we had enough early warning that uh, it was coming out of Texas, much like we do for stripe rust, leaf rust. Uh, the same fungicides seem to, to work very effectively there. So we do have some tools and, and growers are, are pretty savvy about using them now, where a generation ago we just didn't have those kind of options. So. Um, you know, I'm not alarmed over it, but I, I am concerned that uh, we've opened the box to something that we don't fully understand here. And uh, I want to keep it on people's radar. So as we, we do see an, another turnover in some of our varieties here, I would love to see uh, uh, growers in Western Kansas really moving back towards varieties that have that uh, type of resistance wherever they get the opportunity to. I think there's enough things in the lineup now that uh, we don't have to accept that vulnerability uh, maybe like we did uh, over the last uh, seven to five to seven years. Great. Yeah, I think Eric hit it on the head there. I think uh, I was in this, the stem rust nursery with Eric on Friday and seeing some of that susceptibility, how it can really take down a plant was, was, um, was pretty shocking. So it's important to remember that some, yeah, some of the reason we have had not had big epidemics of, of stem rust is because of all of this great resistance that's available in the landscape. Um, there are some new uh, kind of emerging races of stripe rust that I think a lot of pathologists in the U.S. continue to monitor. Right now they're still in East Africa, so that's something that that's not a current um, concern here in Kansas, but it, it might be something, you know, for example, five to ten years could be a problem. So that's something that I think the research the researchers throughout the U.S. are working on pretty closely is, is monitoring some of those new um, those new stem rust pathogens, but but they're not here yet. Yeah, we've been talking about that for for some time. With this UG99 group of of uh, stem rust that's been out there for a while, and um, it's kind of interesting that there's probably more reports of severe stem rust that hasn't gone away in, in East Africa, like Kelsey had said, and, and uh, there's been some reports of, of stem rust sightings in, uh, in parts of Western Europe as well, which uh, do rely heavily on fungicides and, and also less some of their genetic resistance in the last generation as well. So kind of interesting that uh, it seems to be a disease on the move and uh, a kind of emerging vulnerability worldwide to, uh, to some of these stem rust, uh, uh, stem rust pathogens. Okay. Well, makes me a little sad to ask that question at the same time. It's probably something that we all need to have at least in the back of our minds when we're looking at variety selection. So, um, any parting comments for our growers? as they're watching this video thinking about wheat production going forward. Silence. <laughs> Go get them guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we just hope that uh, the wheat crop will finish well, like Jeannie had started out with. This wheat crop has, has come through uh, drought and freeze and, uh, and maybe we're looking at some heat here. So. Uh, let's let's all hope for the the blessing that this will finish up well. Yes. 
And I think Jeannie mentioned this, right? But I know this will be posted, so we won't be able to answer questions live. But of course, I think our contact information was on the slide. So feel free to reach out to us with any other questions or follow-up concerns about anything that was said here. Romulo, you unmuted your mic. Do you have final thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I agree with these guys here. We're looking forward to seeing how this next week's gonna treat the wheat crop now. Uh, with all this heat and, and wind, right? It's already quite windy today here. That's definitely not going to, to be good to a variety that is still heading out as you showed some of those in your plots out there, Jeannie. So uh, we're hopefully that uh, it's going to last just a few days here, but we know that we're getting to the summer. And so the likelihood of this just increasing is, is quite high. So good luck ending up the season. So. Okay. Lucas, any thoughts? No, pray for rain. Pray for rain. That's exactly right. We could sure use um, a break in heat and some rain to add to our, to help fill final, or finish up our grain fill here. So um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and um, end this recording. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. We can reach out to Romolo and Lucas and Eric and Kelsey um, to get some of those questions answered. I encourage you all to swing by and look at your wheat plots and uh, pay or be ready for uh, yield information that will be coming out. And as Lucas mentioned, that Ram Wheat DB um, is a great way to go in and look at different varieties and do some comparisons on varieties that seem like they would fit for our area and look at the yield history on those. So with that, we'll go ahead and, and call this um, done. Thank you guys, all of our speakers. Oh, and a big thank you to all of our plot cooperators. You know, I think uh, they enjoy being plot cooperators and having everybody come out and stop and look at plots and visit about what wheat's going on. And so they got gypped a little bit on wheat plot tours this year also. So if you see those guys, tell them thank you, that um, it really is an investment. And um, I have some guys who keep drills specifically for drilling wheat plots and I really appreciate that. And so thank you to all of our wheat plot cooperators and um, everybody who is part of this project. So with that, I think we'll call it good. Thanks guys.